so that's the Thursday that we have uh, set aside for uh, prayer and fasting. So just uh, mentioning it this week to uh, have that in the back of your mind. We'll uh, mention that again uh, next week. But uh, a week from tomorrow, Thursday of next week, is uh, prayer and fasting. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Um, I'll be sh uh, sharing the word this evening. And um, why don't we just begin with prayer. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we just invite your presence, Lord. Father, we just welcome you in our midst, Lord. Oh, Father, you are the reason, Lord, that we gather, Lord. And, and Father, we just gather, Lord Jesus, to just thank you and praise you, Lord, and to just receive from you, Lord, what you would have for us, Lord, even this evening. So, Father, use the word, Lord, to just uh, encourage, Lord, to just edify. And, and uh, Lord, we just put all things in your hand, and all praise, honor, and glory unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, why don't we open our Bibles to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. <clears throat> I'm going to be sharing a story that's probably familiar to most, and we're going to be taking a look at it uh, through historical eyes, uh, what, what happened. Um, it's, it's pretty clear in the Bible, so I'll just be um, bringing highlights uh, about this story. And then we'll, we will change gear and apply um, spiritual application. Praise the Lord. So the story is about uh, David and Goliath. And like I said, I, that's probably familiar to, to most here. So let's take a look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we will read verses 13 and 14. <clears throat> the word of God says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, and him would be David, in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Praise God. So Saul has rebelled against the Lord. And so the Lord sends an evil spirit to torment him. But this evil spirit is also the means by which David is introduced into Saul's court. So the question is, how do you soothe someone that's afflicted by an evil spirit? Um, in the New Testament, Jesus looked at the person, and he just rebuked the spirit, and that's all it took. <laughs> that was the power of God, and Jesus did that through all of his ministry. He showed the power of God, but more than that, he came to show us the love of God and to show the people how far the religious leaders had strayed from what God had originally intended. So, how do you soothe someone that's afflicted by an evil spirit? Well, it seems you provide someone to play music to help them relax, to soothe them. Uh, way back in the day, they didn't have calm radio. <laughs> they didn't have uh, white noise. Um, and I've heard there's something new. It's brown noise. I really can't tell the difference. All I know is that it's static and it's supposed to uh, settle the mind and just to help you relax and to help you fall asleep. But not in these days. And so the Word of God says uh, we discover that David is a gifted musician. And the Word of God says not only does he play well, he's also handsome. And he's a man of valor. What a combination, right? Okay, you're good looking, you have musical talents, and you're brave. That's a pretty good package. David is both a man of action and he's uh, a man of culture. And he's someone who has good presence. So when he walks into the room, people notice him. People look at him. And he's the sort of man that others are inspired to follow and to, to imitate. When David speaks to you, you feel good. 
And you're glad that he's noticed you. And it's like, what? I can't believe it. David, he, he came up to me and he asked me how I was doing and he just engaged me in conversation. It's like, man, he must really like me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, and um, David has these qualities, uh, so much so that when Saul meets him and gets to know him, Saul is pleased with David. In fact, we're told in the Bible that Saul loved David greatly, and David became his armor bearer. It's almost as if this evil spirit that was tormenting Saul is uh, driven away by the spirit of God that is within David. David who inspires not just by his military success, but also by his musical gifts. Uh, the book of Psalms is a song book. We, we read it um, for its, its um, meditative um, words, but these are songs. So the book of Psalms is a song book like um, the music that, that we sing. It's a song book. And... Um, So we're, we're going to leave that, and now we're going to come to the uh, encounter with, with Goliath. Now comes one of the greatest challenges in the reign of King Saul. The Philistines have found themselves a champion. He's nine feet tall, and he's six feet across. No, he's not. <laughs> uh, he is Arnold Schwarzenegger and a half. Uh, no, he's not, but that just kind of gives you the, uh, I, an idea of what the Bible says that this, this giant Goliath is like. The Bible says that his armor alone weighs nearly 130 pounds. Okay, that could be some young boy, uh, someone's spouse, uh, maybe even yourself. And, and just think of, of a person of that weight is, is the weight of the armor that Goliath wears. He's tough. He's a hardened warrior. He's been fighting battles since he was a teenager. So Goliath, he knows battle. Goliath, he knows about defeating the enemy. <clears throat> so when he challenges the Israelites to send out their best for a one-on-one -on -one contest, um, to fight to see who's the strongest. This goes back years ago, and I don't even know how many years ago. I'm, I'm just going to say um, 40 years. I remember, uh, maybe during the 70s, I don't recall, but I remember that there was a, a TV commercial, and I do not recall what it was that they were pitching. But what I recall is that it was like, like a beach sand dune, like what you would have on the East Coast, um, with the, uh, I don't know, the, the marsh reeds or whatever. And, and so on one side, you have uh, three men walking up the crest of this sand dune, and so they're going from your TV left to right. And then it pans to the opposite side, and coming up the sand dune are three men, and uh, they crest the hill, and they're going from your TV right to left. So they pan back and they show these two groups and they show them coming together and they stand maybe 10 feet apart. So according to the commercial, one of the men on each group is the leader of their nation. And I'm just gonna throw these names out just as an example, okay? So uh, President Biden is facing off with President Putin, okay? So, and then uh, each leader then has his lieutenant, and then a helper, so three men. But in this commercial, they don't actually show anything, but they say, wouldn't it be great if we had the leaders, Biden and Putin, square off uh, a, a WWE cage match, you know, one winner, and the winner wins whatever it is that these two nations are fighting about. 
instead of a military conflict that invites that uh, involves uh, thousands of troops and, and tanks and airplanes and all that kind of stuff, the two guys, the leaders of the country, let's duke it out, winner take all. And again, I don't remember what they were pitching, but that's just kind of what's happening here. Goliath says, I'm the champion for the Philistines. Send me your best guy, and we'll sell it, settle it on the field of battle, me and you. If I win, you guys are subject to us. If you win, <laughs> we'll be subject to you. So that's the story. That's what's happening here. And um, in my mind's eye, I, I can see the whole army of Israel take one giant step back. <laughs> Wait, there's no champion. How did that happen? And the thing is, uh, no one's mad enough, no one's crazy enough to take on this challenge. But at the same time, they can't ignore it. Here's this big guy. He's just called out the army of Israel. You can't, like, pretend that it's not there or that it's not happening. And their honor as a nation is at stake. And so the stalemate begins. It says that for 40 days, Goliath would rise up early in the morning. He would go out to the middle of the field, and he would shout across the valley. And he would say, you Israelites, send me your champion. And, but of course, nothing happened. So this went on for, for 40 days. And each day, the Israelites became more and more afraid and more and more dismayed. Now we switch scenes. Then into the scene comes this young and naive youngest son of Jesse. And David is sent to the battle lines um, on an errand by his father to take provisions to his older brothers. These older brothers, they've followed Saul, but David is left behind to tend the sheep and to go back and forth bringing supplies and possibly playing the harp for Saul. This time, though, when David gets to the Israelite camp, the army has just gone out to face the Philistine in their morning ritual of defiance. Now, you can imagine David, can't you? He's been left behind with the sheep. All of his brothers have gone uh, into the army, and they're at this battlefield. But like most young men, David wants to be with the men where the fighting is. So what does he do? He goes and he finds his brothers, knowing that they'll be somewhere near the action. And so he's standing there talking to his brothers when Goliath appears for his daily challenge. So David is seeing what's going on, and he begins to just uh, inquire around those that he's in the midst of. And it's like, what's going on? What's, what's happening here? What's this guy doing? And they tell him, these men that are around David, tell David how desperate King Saul is for someone to fight Goliath and so that he, King Saul, can save face. Mind you, remember that Saul, the Bible says, is a head taller than anybody else. So in a crowd of men, you could easily spot the king because he sticks out. Okay, it would be like us standing next to uh, a seven-footer basketball player. He would definitely stand out. So it's the same with King Saul. And um, so it would be logical to think that this king, who's a head taller than everybody else in his army, would be the one to go out and fight this, this giant, this Philistine. And, well, he's the king, isn't he? Shouldn't he be leading his men to battle instead of being in the back lines and pointing his men where to go? Uh, I know it's been said uh, by um, several uh, leaders that uh, 
You lead from the front. You don't lead from the rear. You lead by example. If I want you to do it, then I need to do it. And if I'm going to do it, then I inspire those around me to step forward with me and do what it is that I want to accomplish. That's what Saul should have been doing. He should have been leading from the front. But instead, he's quaking and shaking his knees in fear in the back. Not good for a king. So David listens to the men in disbelief at what it is that they told him that Saul had said he would give to whoever would face this giant. So what is Saul offering? And if we look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 25, the word of God says, So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and will give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. So as David is talking to these men, this is what he hears, and it's like, Nah, that can't be right. Did I just hear what I thought I just heard? <laughs> so David wants to make sure that he heard it correctly. And if we go down to um, verse 26 and 27 of chapter 17. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who, who kills him. So David thought he heard what he heard. And so then he asked to make sure. And yes, in fact, he did hear what he heard, what the man had told him. And David thinks to himself, all of this just to kill an uncircumcised Philistine? Doesn't anyone understand what's going on here? So in David, here is the whom shall I send? We've read that before, or maybe we're going to read it. <laughs> I'm confused right now. Anyways, it's in the Bible. <laughs> Whom shall I send? As far as uh, uh, its placement, it's to relation to the story, um, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just skip that. Praise the Lord. So David understands. Okay, on this side, we have this Philistine. Uncircumcised is shorthand for someone who has no relationship with God. Someone who relies on dumb idols. On the other hand, we have the armies of the living God. A mere mortal and Goliath, the living God. That seems a bit unbalanced, wouldn't you say? when it would come to a fight, wouldn't you think? Forget the fact that he's, he's nine feet tall and that he weighs 300 pounds. Okay? He would be like Shaq, only two feet taller. Um, there's nothing compared to our living God. The God who made the world and everything in it who formed the heavens with his fingers. But why can't anyone else see it? I don't know how large Saul's army is. 
I'm sure it's in the, the thousands, maybe the hundreds of thousands, I'm not sure, tens of thousands at, at least. And the only person that sees what I just described is David, one man out of this entire army sees this. Nobody else does. Is it that David is just naive? He's too young to know really what, what war and battle is about. And so he's fantasized in his mind, you know, about fighting this giant. Is that what it is? That he hasn't experienced enough of this world to see that there's more to this situation than, than what he's thinking in his mind? Or is it that the army, and Saul in particular, have forgotten or perhaps never realized the power of the God that they supposedly worship? David hasn't. That's for sure. David's lived with this living God all of his life. David has sat out on the hills watching the sheep at night looking up into the sky, reflecting on the wonders of God's creation. Out on the hills, there's no lights. It's black. So you can see the immense span of our universe, all the stars in the sky. And David is there, tending the sheep, on a hill, hands behind his back, looking, looking at God's creation, having fellowship with God. That's what David has been doing all of this time. He sought God's help time and time again. The word of God says that he's faced the lion, and he's faced the bear, and he's been victorious. He's defeated these animals from snatching the sheep uh, under his care uh, in the flock. So it was David's alone time with God that prepared David for this day right now in this army with the Philistines. And David has seen the way that God has protected him and given him victory over these wild animals. So David stands here and he looks across the valley at this giant of a Philistine and all he sees is just another man who opposes God and who will die at God's hand in the end. That's what David sees, but he's the only one that sees that. And so David is brought to Saul, and David is decked out in Saul's armor. And David says, uh, sorry, king, but I, I can't wear this. It's cumbersome, it's awkward, it's limiting. Uh, you know, thanks, but no thanks. So David takes off Saul's armor. And so it's more than just David being in his clothes with his staff and a sling. So the question again, whom shall I send? Ask God and Saul. David responds, here I am, send me. Goliath is understandably amused when he sees this young boy approaching. In fact, he laughs at David that David comes at him with a stick as if Goliath were a dog. And Goliath says that. But Goliath has miscalculated. David isn't coming against Goliath armed with a stick, not even with a sling. David is coming at Goliath armed with the power of God. In 1 Samuel 17, we'll read verse 45. It says, then David said to the Philistine, ye come to me with sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defiled. That is the power of David. He comes against Goliath in the power of God. He can almost feel sorry for Goliath. He doesn't know what's, what's coming at him. And he doesn't realize that he doesn't stand a chance. Rather like a lot of people thought about 
Mike Tyson's opponents. I think 90 seconds was his fastest knockout. <laughs> that's, a, that's incredible. 90 seconds, all this hype, all this money that you paid. If you were in the concession stand getting popcorn and a hot dog, uh, you, you missed it. <laughs> You're still in line waiting for your goodies and the fight's over. And so it is here. So it is here with David and Goliath. The fight is over before it's even started. Do you remember that scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where Indiana Jones meets this huge um, Arab guy and this guy has an even huger, if that is a word, sword? And this guy, he's standing there and he's just flipping it and twirling it and doing everything. And so Indiana Jones, he, uh, he's a little bit uh, struck by the sight. And then after his um, foe stops and stands ready to attack, what does Jones do? He takes out a gun and he shoots him. <laughs> Game over. <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> Goliath is outgunned and he's outclassed. And uh, to make it clear what's going on here, um, Samuel says in uh, verse, uh, chapter 17, verse 46, second half, that all the earth may know that there is a God. And verse 47, then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. It's not our battle. It's not our fight. It's God's fight. But he's asking us to take part in this fight. It's like Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat cried out to the Lord because his enemy was coming against him. And God told Jehoshaphat, get your army ready. Get them in battle array and wait. So he called up his army. He got them into fighting position. And they waited. And not once did they take a step towards the enemy. Because God defeated the enemy. But he still wanted his people to, to have a part in that even though they didn't swing a single sword or throw a spear or shoot an arrow. They were ready to do so, but not one of those things happened. They were ready to fight, but God did not ask them to fight. God defeated the enemy. The battle is the Lord's, but he may ask us to take part in his plan. We don't know. Jehoshaphat had no idea that that's what God was going to do. We have no idea what God is going to ask of us. But when he asks us to be ready to participate in his plan, we need to be willing to do so and not be a Saul and stand back at the army with our, our knees quaking. Praise God. And so, for those of you that are familiar with the story, you know how the story ends. Uh, let's turn to 1 Samuel um, chapter 13. And we will look at verse 14. 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. And the... Uh, middle part of verse 14 the word of God says the Lord has sought for himself a man the Lord has sought for himself a man God is looking for people like you and me just ordinary people there was nothing special about David he was a 
a keeper of the sheep. He was out in the fields. He was nowhere near the battle. But that's who God chose, just an ordinary person. But God is looking for three qualities in us. And so now we leave the historical part of David and Goliath, and we will look at the spiritual aspects of this. So number one, God is looking for spirituality. God is looking for a man after his own heart. That's the first quality. So what does it mean to be a person after God's own heart? It means that you are a person whose life is in harmony with the Lord's. What is important to him is important to you. What burdens him should burden you. When God says, go to the right, you go to the right. When God says, you need to stop that in your life, guess what? You need to stop. When he says, this is wrong, and I want you to change, you deal with it. You come to terms with it because you have a heart for God. That's the bottom line of biblical Christianity. When you are deeply spiritual, then you have a heart that is sensitive to the things of God. And so the question is, do you? Not does your school, but do you? Not asking does your spouse, but do you? Not your church, but do you? So that if nobody else was here except you alone and you could hear the echo of your own voice, you could say, I am a person after God's own heart. If so, you're well on your way. Praise God. Let's turn to Second uh, Chronicles chapter 16. And we will look at verse 9. So Second Chronicles 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So what is God looking for? He's looking for men and women whose hearts belong to him, and they belong to him completely. That means that there are no closets that are locked, that there are no rugs under which something can be swept. That means that when wrong comes, you come to terms with it quickly. You are grieved over wrong. You're concerned about those things that displease him. So the first quality David had was spirituality. Let's take a look at the second. So when God makes a choice, it's contrary to human reason. Bible says that man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So we see with physical eyes, and so we see what we think is right, but we can't see what's inside. God see, sees what's inside. So many times we can be deceived. We would choose people that look like Saul. That's what the people asked for because he was a head taller than everybody else. They said, look at that guy. He should be our king. And they chose a human to lead them instead of the everlasting God. So they took their eyes off of God and they 
looked to themselves and they looked outward and they chose Saul. God, however, chose David. And that is the difference. Man, Israel, saw Saul, chose Saul because of the outward appearance. God saw David's heart. God chose David. And David has become the standard of kings in Israel ever since his time. You either walked in the ways of David or you did not. So we should go with, with God's choice every time. <laughs> Amen? Praise the Lord. God chooses people that have character. The first is spirituality. And the second, uh, if we read in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil. Go, I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. God says, I have provided myself. I am choosing this time. Not man, not you. God says, that's my man. So what was it that, that God saw in David? He saw a heart that was completely surrendered to him. And second, he saw humility. Humility. So the first quality is spirituality. The second is humility. Humility may best be described as a servant's heart. In Psalms 89. We'll look at Verses um, 19 in the first half of 20. So Psalm 89, 19. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from my people. I have found my servant David. I have found my servant, David, my servant. I have found my servant, and his name is David. This is God. He's saying that. Those words, my servant, describe David more than any other words when God is referring to him. God says of David, he is my servant. He can be so many other, more other things, but what is important to me is that he's my servant. My servant. And we'll look at uh, Psalm 89, the second half of verse 20 through 21. So with my holy oil, I have anointed him with whom my hand shall be established. The first quality that God looks for inside of our lives is that sense of sensitivity to him. My heart is completely yours. That is what God desires of us. The second, I want you to serve me and I want you to serve others. So as we surrender our heart to the Lord, as we become his servant, as we serve the Lord, then it flows that with the love that we have for God the Father, then that just flows outward. So we have this connection, vertical, with the Father, and then it goes horizontal. And we share that with, with each other, especially the lost. And that's what God is concerned about. He's concerned about the lost.
So that's David. God looked at David as he was keeping the sheep. And he, did it, and he did as his father Jesse asked of him, and God said, he's got those qualities. David is a good boy. He's an obedient son. He does what his father asks of him. I know that David will do what I ask of him. If he obeys his father, he's going to obey me. So the third quality is integrity. And we can see that in Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verse 72. The word of God says, So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So it's integrity. God is not looking for magnificent specimens of humanity. He's looking for deeply spiritual, genuinely humble, honest to the core servants. David shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart. Integrity. It's what you are when nobody's looking. It's what you do when you're alone in your, in your house or any other place you might be by yourself and nobody's around. What you do, what comes out of you, that is integrity. Integrity is honestly right down to the marrow of your bones. That's David, and that can be us also. It's in the little things that we do that we prove ourselves capable of the big things, like the parable where servants were entrusted with goods, and when the servants invested and they gained for the master, the master says, well done. You were faithful in this. Let me give you this much more. God is asking the same thing of us. He wants us to be faithful in the little things. If we can be trusted in the little things, he will charge us with much greater things. When God develops inner quality, he's never in a hurry. God was working in David when David was out tending the sheep preparing David to lead his people. So there was a time of preparation. David didn't know it. David was just going about his father's business, his father Jesse. But God used that to make David a shepherd for God's people. So God is at work on us to see if we're willing to do the little things. God is in no hurry as he works in us to bring those inner qualities to shape our character to one that is pleasing to him. Just as God did with David, so he wants to do in us. As God shapes and as God fashions those qualities in our alone time with him, as he prepares us and makes us ready, when God asks, whom shall I send? Like David, we can say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Pastor Mike? I'm sorry. Brother Reddy? <laughs> uh, Brother Reddy, if, if I could ask you to come forward and close, I'm sorry. Praise the Lord. <laughs> that was uh, that was good. That was it was, it was encouraging. I just want to read a scripture here. 
Father Samuel. It talks about David, and uh, Brother Marco touched on it, and I just want to read the scripture here. It says that, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or at the height of the stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. Just thank you for uh, that word, Brother Marco. It's encouraging to know that, uh, that many times God calls us. A lot of times the circumstances prevail in such a way that everything seems against us. But you know what? That, that's where God puts us. God never chose a people that we have everything just perfect. Sometimes you may feel that you're imperfect for that situation. But Brother Marco touched on God using those people who are imperfect. And he's, he's looking to see if we're willing to stand in the gap. What happens when you stand in the gap? You're standing for the Lord. That's what happens. Your faith is really being tested. Just like David. He says, hey, who is this guy? Who is this guy saying these things against the Lord, the Lord's army, the living God? Same with us. Many times in our life, in many situations, those things will occur. And it's an opportunity for us to stand in the gap. It is really that time. Just like he said, it's the small things. We think it has to be the big things, but it's not necessarily so. That's what I find in life. I find the very difficult <laughs> difficulties in the small things. The big things are usually everyone sees you, but the small things is between you and God when he speaks to you because his word says he sees your heart. You know what's interesting about the heart? God cannot make you love him. God can never make you love him. You must understand that. If we read the scriptures and we understand, even as the word came today, God is there for us. We need to have that love in our heart to reach out to those who are lost and dying. We have to walk in such a way that our hands are open, not closed. Because many times those who profess to be Christians who know the Lord are not willing to stand in the gap. You know why? Because it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. I always believe what the scripture says that David, that Haruna, he, he said, take it all, David. Do the sacrifice. Here's, the, here's all the implements for the sacrifice. David says, I will not do that. He says, I want not take something that doesn't cost me something. It must cost us something. That's, that's a, a key ingredient to walking with the Lord. You must examine your life and see, does it really cost you something? If it doesn't cost you something, then there's something missing. There's something missing. The Lord is good. He is faithful to his people. Thank you, Brother Marco. Maybe we could stand and we can, uh, we can close in prayer. And if there's anyone who needs a personal touch, you know, the Word of God says when two or three are gathered, and it's a very simple scripture, but many don't believe that. They believe the Lord will save them, but they won't believe that God is here. 
They won't believe that. You ask people, it says, well, you know, they just take it flippantly, but be serious about the word of God. When two or three are gathered, God is in the midst, and he sees our hearts even now as that word came. Where is our heart? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, Lord. Lord, we're so thankful, Lord, that you do care about us. You say, cast our cares upon you because you care for us. Lord, you care for us, Lord. What is in us, Lord, that you care for us? What did we do that was so good that you care for us, Lord? You did everything. We deserve hell. If anything, we deserve hell, Lord. But you prevented that from happening by dying on the cross for us, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you've been so merciful to us, so merciful to us, Lord. You have done the work, Lord, and we have received all the benefits of your work. You're the one. You're the one we look towards. You're the one we look to, Lord. Lord, you see our faults. You see at times we are unfaithful. Lord, have mercy on us, Lord. Lord, we want to try to do, live for you the best we can, but we need your strength. We need your courage. Steadfast our heart, Lord, our soul in these times, Father. Bless your people, Lord. Bless your people, Lord. Touch them. Wherever they're at, Lord, you would touch them and show them you, you do care. We just thank you, Lord, for your, for your kindness and your great love towards us. You're our faithful God. You are our faithful God, and we look to you. Bless your people, Lord. I ask that you bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there anyone who needs prayer? Please come. Jesus is here. He will meet you on the road of life. Thank you, Lord. Surely my God is the strength of my soul Your love defends me Your love defends me When I feel like I'm all alone Your love defends me Your love defends me
encouraging word tonight and just bless brother Marco Lord thank you God for blessing your people tonight God may we Lord like David um, seek to just be your servants to walk in humility Lord to honor you God in our actions to be people of integrity to be like Jesus thank you for this time tonight may you be with your people tonight take them home give them rest and thank you for this time together in Jesus name we all pray Amen. God bless you. There's prayer Saturday morning.